SS Liberty, a United States naval vessel that occurred on June 8, 1967. Well, if you haven't, you're about to learn more about it. June 8th marks the 57th anniversary of the attack on the USS Liberty. It's important because the United States is one of the closest allies of the state of Israel. And Israel is in a state of constant conflict in the Middle East that we're called upon to back them up. One normally would say if America and Israel are allies, what's the problem in backing them up? One of the problems is, of course, the history of the attack on the USS Liberty. USS Liberty was a United States Navy intelligence gathering ship. It was operating off the coast of Egypt in the morning and afternoon of June 8th of 1967 during the six-day war between Israel and Egypt when it was attacked by Israeli aircraft and Israeli torpedo boats. Now, this is where the story gets a little complicated. According to survivors of the US Liberty, this was a deliberate attack. They feel that Israel singled them out. There was an American flag flying. The ship's identity numbers were clearly visible and Israel pressed home the attack. Not just one attack by an aircraft, but two. Not just one attack by a torpedo boat, but two. And it left 34 Americans dead, 171 Americans wounded. A ship listing badly in danger of sinking and the survivors of the ship in shock about what had happened because they knew who their attackers were. Israel claims that this was an accident, a case of mistaken identity. There are a lot of conspiracies out there too now. We hear that Israel attacked the ship because the ship was monitoring the massacre of Egyptian prisoners of war by the Israelis. The Israelis attacked the ship because the ship was monitoring sensitive Israeli communities communications about its upcoming attack against Syria. That Israel attacked the ship in order to blame it on the Egyptians so that the United States would intervene in the conflict on the side of Israel. What is the truth? But to get to the truth, we need to actually examine the ship's mission. From that, we understand more about what exactly happened on June 8th. The USS Liberty is an intelligence gathering ship. We could receive any signal that was out there, low band, high band, anything, intercepting it, recording it. And we did have on board some translators who could have immediate translation of what was going on. We would actually bounce signals off the moon back to NSA. We're spies. I mean, we're intercepting messages from embassies, uh, military bases, police, anything and everything that we could get to ensure that the United States was comfortable with what was going on in the world and no one's conspiring against us. Basically, it was to protect our interests. This was the Cold War. American President Lyndon Johnson knew that the Russians already had substantial military influence in Egypt. He needed to find out what they were going to do next, to make sure that a local conflict did not become a world war, with the USA backing Israel and Russia siding with the Arab cause. Our primary purpose was to intercept communications of the Russian spy aircraft as it were at Alexandria, Egypt, and then that was our job was to find them. We were not targeted against the Israelis. On board, it carries a collection system known as the USN-855. It's a signals intelligence or SIGIN collection platform that focuses primarily on high-frequency HF or UHF, VHF signals. One of the key elements of the 855 system was its ability to take apart multiplexed communication. Multiplexing is where you take different communication streams and you combine them into a single channel. What the USS Liberty was able to do with the 855 system was to de-link the different channels so that they could be assessed and monitored individually. At that time, the system that was used to do this was a very sensitive system and a very critical system for meeting the intelligence collection requirements of the United States government. In May of 1967, the USS Liberty was at port in the Ivory Coast, and it was tasked by the US intelligence community to move off the coast of Egypt to monitor what was happening with the Egyptian military. It undertook this, it went around, and went through Gibraltar, entered the Mediterranean, and started approaching Egypt. What's important though is as it approached Egypt, it carried out additional intelligence collection operations as it moved down the Mediterranean against Morocco, against Algeria. Now, this is important 
important to understand. You see, to carry out its technical collection to the best of the technical abilities, the ship needs to operate in close proximity to the shore. The ideal at that time, what they were doing off the coast of Morocco and Algeria was between 3.5 nautical miles and six nautical miles. It's called the CPA. It's the closest point of approach. So the CPA for the USS Liberty heading down towards Egypt was between six and 13.5 nautical miles. The ship needs to be operating at a relatively slow speed. The ideal for collection is about five nautical miles per hour. And the ship collects in a collection area, area of operation, which is about 50 nautical miles in length. So you are designated an area of operations, an area of collection. You navigate into there, so your CPA is 13.5 to 6 nautical miles, and you're operating at a speed of roughly 5 nautical miles. And this is the posture that the USS Liberty took as it approached Egypt. While it's approaching Egypt, while it's coming down to the Mediterranean on 5 June, Israel launches a surprise attack against Egypt and Jordan. This is the beginning of the Six-Day War. By the time the USS Liberty comes off the coast of Egypt, it's the night of June 7th, June 8th, and the war is all but over. Indeed, on June 8th, Egypt surrendered. The war ended at four o'clock in the afternoon. But the war was still raging as the USS Liberty came on to the shore. As it is approaching Egypt, there is concern amongst the US military command about the danger that the USS Liberty faced. It was now entering into a war zone. So before it came into Egyptian waters, its CPA was modified to be between 12.5 and 20 nautical miles. So it would be at a further distance off the shore. Now again, the further you get from the shore, the less effective your intelligence collection becomes. You become limited in what you can and cannot collect. And this is an important fact because there's some people that are saying that the job of the USS Liberty was to collect against the Israeli target and to collect effectively against the Israeli target, especially Israeli military communications taking place in contact with the Egyptians, you need to be close to the shore. So right off the bat, as the USS Liberty approaches the Egyptian shore, it's degrading its ability to collect. Now let's put this in perspective. What makes the USS Liberty important? Prior to the USS Liberty arriving off the shore of Egypt, the United States was operating airborne SIGINT collection platforms, C-130s, EC-121s. Initially, they were operating these basically eight times a week. What they did is they modified that so that it would be operating almost continuously on a daily basis. So we already had airborne collection platforms going against the Egyptian target. Why the USS Liberty then? The USS Liberty is the equivalent of 13 airborne collection platforms. It has that much capacity. And so the idea was to get the USS Liberty in there to collect as much as possible about the Egyptian target. But the urgency of this collection wasn't such that it needed to be as close to shore as was optimal. They started to push it back, as I said, 13.5 to 20. As the ship approached, though, the U.S. Naval Command, the U.S. Military Command, became very concerned now about the safety of the crew, about the safety of the ship, about the safety of the sensitive intelligence collection systems and materials that are on board. And the order came down to the USS Liberty to modify, to go to 80 to 100 nautical miles offshore. Again, what's important about this? One, there's a recognition on the part of the U.S. Military Command that the USS Liberty was entering into a very dangerous area. Two, once you move to 100 nautical miles offshore, the effectiveness of your UHF and VHF collection it drops down to minimal, which means that there were no high-value targets that the USS Liberty was collecting against. It was collecting against normal targets. It was collecting to, to find out routine intelligence as opposed to the kind of specificity that some of the conspiracy theorists talk about, collecting against Israeli prisoner of war massacres or Israeli command and control or Israeli strategic intent. The other thing to note is that the USS Liberty didn't have designated Hebrew linguists on board. In fact, they had very few Arabic linguists. As the ship passed through Rhoda, there was an emergency requirement put out for Arab linguists and three out of the four available to the US military at the time were allocated to the USS Liberty. One of these three was a so-called special Arabic linguist. That's the term that the US military used at the time to describe a Hebrew speaker, but he wasn't brought on board for his Hebrew capabilities, his Arabic capabilities. So there was no designated Hebrew or Israeli intercept capacity. Any collection that was done against the Israeli target was secondary in nature, serendipitous, so to speak, as they were doing a full spectrum collection of all available frequencies. While we were trying to monitor, find something coming from the direction of, of Egypt, there just was nothing.
So the notion that the USS Liberty somehow posed a SIGINT collection threat against the Israelis, that claim doesn't hold water. The USS Liberty, however, didn't get the order to go off to 100 nautical miles. There was a communications failure on the part of the US High Command. The order was sent, but the procedures that require a hard copy written order to back up the phone order meant that before the order could be sent and transmitted to USS Liberty, it had to be confirmed in writing. There was confusion. That didn't happen. And by the time Captain Captain McGonagall, the commander of the USS Liberty, got the order to pull back to 100 nautical miles. The ship had already been attacked. So the ship is coming off the coast of Egypt. It's early in the morning on June 8th, and it notices that it's being tracked. The ship's log recorded an Israeli photo reconnaissance plane flying over the Liberty. It was easily identifiable as a NOR Atlas aircraft, and those are photo reconnaissance aircraft. Israeli records obtained by Al Jazeera show that their reconnaissance plane reported the Liberty as an American spy ship, hull number GTR-5. And it circled the ship, kind of in a broad circle, and headed back towards Israel. Israeli planes then continued to fly over the Liberty all morning. And they would do half-moon passes over us, and we saw that they were Israeli. They were slowly lumbering over our ship and we were waving at them, they were waving at us. They were sophisticated, almost as sophisticated as we were as far as surveillance and, and technology. They had everything. We supplied them with all the technology to this day. And I felt that we were, in, we were in great shape because they knew who we were. They're our friends. We felt safe. Actually, it was a secure feeling to see them. There was one other thing which made the crew feel safe. We had an American flag flying the standard, and then we put up the holiday colors, which is a huge American flag. And it was a bright sunny day with the wind blowing, I don't know, five or 10 knots, the flag was unfurled. You could see it for miles. What was of interest of this ship? At the time, the Israeli military was saying that its forces, who were in the process of occupying the Egyptian coastal city of Al Arish, were saying that they were receiving fire from ships offshore. So the Israelis were sent to investigate, and they found the ship, and they were unable to identify it. This is the Israeli version. They were unable to identify it. It got plotted on the Israeli chart as an unknown vessel. Later on, another Israeli aircraft was sent out, and this one came back and said, no, 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 we saw the, the, the numbers of the ship. We've identified it as an American vessel. And so the ship was not only identified as an American vessel, but because it was friendly and wasn't a threat, it was taken off the chart. Meaning that from the Israeli perspective, there now no longer was a symbol on their map that said this is the USS Liberty. Later on, as the Israeli ground commanders are saying, look, we're under fire, we're under fire, we need somebody to come in and suppress the fire coming from his Egyptian ships off the coast of El Arish, Israeli fighter craft were sent out. When they received the status report from the Israeli high command, however, they weren't told that there was a US naval vessel operating off the coast. It had been taken off the map. And so when they first approached the ship, they claimed that they couldn't identify it, but they assumed that it was an Egyptian freighter that could have been used as a platform to strike Israeli troops. And so they initiated the attack. First attack was a strafing run targeting the bridge of the ship. Captain McGonagall was wounded. Other people were killed. The ship was under attack. They were followed by a rocket attack, again, that killed an additional number of sailors, and it made it difficult to steer the ship. The USS Liberty was now in crisis. We had no way to defend ourselves. And it was just, we we're just slaughtered. And they shot up the life rafts uh, that were put into the water, and they shot the ones that were still on board the ship. Bullet holes, shell holes everywhere, blood. The forecastle, the front part of the ship, was just red with blood. Out of a crew of just under 300, there were 34 killed and uh, 172 injured in varying degrees to uh, life-threatening, life-debilitating injuries. So that was more than two-thirds of the crew. Throughout the attack, the Liberty had been silent to the outside world. All its aerials were either smashed or jammed. When the attack started and we realized that we needed help, we tried to communicate with the Sixth Fleet. They were jamming both our distress frequencies and our tactical frequencies. The tactical frequencies is all right, but the international distress frequencies is a violation of international law to jam them, and the Israelis were jamming them. And we could not get a signal across. Here's the question I have to ask. Who would know the frequencies other than an ally? And who was the ally in the war? It wasn't Egypt. It was Israel. They would know, and only they would know in this conflict, what our frequencies would be. We had one whip antenna which hadn't worked the entire cruise and it had a bullet hole in it. One of the radio men had taken 
a reel of coax cable and ran it from one of the transmitters back there to that whip antenna and took some shrapnel in the process. He got out and made a Firefox, Firefox, this is Rock Star, Rock Star. Under attack by unidentified surface and naval air units require immediate assistance. There's a U.S. aircraft carrier operating around 400, 500 nautical miles away that immediately launched four A-4 Skyhawk aircraft and four A-1 aircraft to respond to this, but they weren't going to get there in time. The ship now is on fire, smoking. The flag that had been flying had been shot away. Meanwhile, Israeli patrol vessels were sent to investigate the area off of al Arish to find the vessels that were firing against Israeli troops, and they see smoke, so they immediately divert and start heading towards the now burning USS Liberty. The smoke obscured the the ship, at least this again is according to the Israelis on board the torpedo aircraft, and they were unable to see a flag. As they approached the vessel, Captain McGonagall initially gave orders for sailors manning two 50 caliber machine gun mounts on the front of the ship to open fire on the ships. And then realizing that these were Israelis and maybe he shouldn't fire on them, he rescinded that order. But it was too late. One of the 50 caliber machine guns opened up on the Israeli torpedo boats and receiving fire from the American vessel, the Israelis assumed that it was a hostile ship and they began their attack, launching torpedoes blew a hole in the ship. The ship began to flood. Men were killed. Tragically, some men, including a Marine who went down into the flooded spaces to rescue his trapped shipmates, they were locked in the ship when they had to shut the hatches and lock them to prevent the flooding of that compartment from spreading to the ship. And they subsequently drowned. The torpedo boats, as they began to press home their attack, realized, though, it was an American ship. They saw the flag. They saw the number. They backed off. They later approached the ship asking if the ship needed help. Upon not receiving an answer, they fled the area. They returned later to investigate at this time, the Israeli high command is going crazy because it becomes apparent that they had attacked an American ship. They notify the U.S. naval attaché and they notify the U.S. embassy and the embassy begins to send the word out that a U.S. naval vessel had been attacked, that the Israelis had attacked it. The Israelis are claiming that it's a big mistake. And that's where we have it. Later, Israeli helicopters came out and offered to assist with rescue operations to recover bodies that had left the ship, but Captain McGonagall didn't respond and the helicopters left. Was this a deliberate attack? All evidence seems to point to it being a tragic mistake on the part of Israel. But here's the problem. Neither the United States government nor the Israeli government have ever been willing to sit down and tell the full story. They've released bits and pieces. Information has been declassified over time. And when you look at the totality of the picture, it tends to support the notion what happened was just a tragic series of mistakes that came together at this moment that left a U.S. Navy ship on fire, burning, 34 sailors dead, 171 wounded. It was real bad. And the doctor said to him, do you want me to operate? He says, you're probably going to die if I do it, and you'll certainly die if I don't. And, and he said, go ahead, doctor. And so when the doctor operated, uh, we held him as tight as we could. It was horrible pain, I'm sure, for him. And uh, all of a sudden, he went, he went limp, and he died right there. I don't want to ever see anything like that again. The attack on the Liberty instantly triggered a domestic political crisis. According to documents released under the Freedom of Information Act, one solution suggested in American government circles was to sink the Liberty so journalists could not photograph it and inflame public opinion against the Israelis. The NSA rejected this idea with an impolite comment. Handling the media became the top priority. I was taken to my home in White Oak, Maryland. My name is uh, Patricia Blue Rishakis, and my husband was killed on the Liberty. And by the time I got there, there were any number of people from the National Security Agency there. They were there to make sure that I didn't speak to anyone uh, from the press, and I didn't. They stayed night and day. This audio tape, which has never been broadcast before, was recorded in real time by the Israeli military during the assault. The woman's voice in the background is counting down the seconds. It proves that Israeli commanders knew all along that they were attacking an American ship. I was listening to the chatter. 
the night before. They knew it was an American ship that came into the area. They knew who we were. Attack on the Liberty, Johnson himself briefed Newsweek magazine off the record that the Israelis had attacked, and the reason they'd attacked was that they thought this was an intelligence ship that was intercepting perhaps Israeli as well as Egyptian communications. But then everything changed. The fact that Johnson himself was the leaker uh, and briefer of Newsweek was soon leaked. And this alarmed, of course, the Israeli embassy and, and their, their leading friends in the Jewish organizations. And the Israeli embassy uh, regarded this as a major problem uh, and that uh, what Johnson had told Newsweek uh, practically amounted to blood libel. Declassified Israeli documents show they were going to threaten President Johnson with blood libel, gross anti-Semitism, and that would end his political career. For the people that were subjected to this attack, that's not good enough. They want to know the truth. They have questions. They feel that there's been a cover-up. And indeed, the way the US government has behaved in this incident, it could lend itself to the notion that there has been a cover-up. Senior US naval officials, including the admiral in command of the fleet, came on the ship to interview the sailors. They made the sailors sign non-disclosure agreements. The sailors were forbidden to ever talk about this incident. And they feel that no real inquiry has been made to this topic. But in defense of the US Navy, the USS Liberty was involved in some of the most sensitive intelligence collection at that time. A lot of the details about how the USS Liberty was operating, what its performance parameters were, etc., lend itself to a deeper understanding of how the US intelligence community uses platforms like the USS Liberty to collect against very sensitive intelligence targets. And so it was only natural that the US Navy would be reticent in full disclosure, so to speak. But this doesn't do the survivors of the USS Liberty justice. And to be honest, at this juncture, 77 years after the fact, the things that were sensitive back then are no longer sensitive today. There's literally no reason for the United States government not to declassify everything about the USS Liberty incident so that the full truth can be understood. The heroes of the US Liberty deserve nothing less. And as Americans, as we struggle to come to grips with the nature of our relationship with Israel today, we need to know the truth, whether or not the Israeli government ordered an attack against a defenseless U.S. Navy vessel. 34 Americans lost their lives that day. 171 were wounded. They're forgotten. We can never forget them. We must pursue the truth. As long as they're survivors and, and maybe children of survivors, I think this will probably be an annual event. And salute. Pollard. The names of the 34 killed are read out. Punctuated by the tolling of a Navy bell. It's important to not forget what happened and to continue to try to find out why it happened and, and who made it happen. June 8th is USS Liberty Remembrance Day. The NSA has never released the documents that would reveal the full truth about Israel's attack. Special thanks to Scott Ritter and the U.S. Tour of Duty. This has been a Propaganda & Co. production.